Well, good early afternoon. Imagine what it was like to be a member of an intact ecosystem. We're not anymore, of course, but if you just go back 12,000 years, we were. That's a very short time in geologic history. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that when I start to talk about how we can behave like that again, only using modern technology to do it. We arose out of the uh, verdant plains of East Africa some 200,000 years ago and spent over 95% of our lives spreading out throughout the planet and living off the land and taking advantage of intact ecosystems. And then all of a sudden, we got this idea about farming in our heads in many, many different places all at the same time. Miracle, like some space guy came down and showed us how to do it. As a result, well, you'll see, I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but I'd like to show you what it would be like to live in a city that behaved like an ecosystem. That's my theme. So let's start with how would we know if we achieved that? When everybody gets this, and before that happens, we're not ecologically balanced, and we're not fair to each other either. This is what we should be born with as a heritage. This is part of my genome. It says I need this much to stay alive. So what's wrong with us? Why are all these problems facing us today? Because we're not just one species, are we? Although the genome says that. We behave like a hundred, how many nations are there now? Listed at the United Nations, there's 190 different nations. Each one behaves like a different species with re regards to resource analysis and allocations and hoarding and says, this is mine, not yours. We can't keep doing this. We have to start doing something different. <laughs> We've just heard a lot of talks about where we live. You wanna see your house, turn out the lights and you'll see this. <clears throat> That's what NASA did. NASA turned out the lights and showed us where everybody lived. And it kind of startled us to see how developed and built up we really were. Just like I said, 15,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand years, there were no farms, no cities, and about a million people. And today, today, there are 6.8, hmm, 6.8 billion people. And we use the size of South America to farm. That doesn't include grazing land. There are some Wisconsin demographers that think we use it all if you throw that last equation into the, to the mix. As far as cities are concerned, it's a black box. In go the resources, we use it up, we create wastes of all kinds, and we throw that away. And where does it go? I don't know, where does it go? <laughs> it probably goes where you live. <laughs> you know, if you all live downstream from where that waste started, you're the brunt of it. And if it's upstream, of course, you're free of it. That really shouldn't be the case. That's not how an ecosystem behaves. Granted, agriculture got us to where we are today. 6.8 billion genomes can now work together to solve the next big problem of how do we all live together in a balanced way and imitate the best features of an ecosystem using our technologies. All of these insults to the earth, using up all the water, making agrochemicals work the land for us because the land wasn't intended to do that to begin with. It's a natural system that we encroached into. We got food, but we also produced agricultural runoff. As uh, Jeffrey mentioned earlier, uh, my family is from New Orleans, and if my grandfather were alive today, well, what did he do in the old days? He was a shrumper. He was a shrumper. He wasn't a shrimper, he was a shrumper. You know, shrump, that's what it was all about, the Forrest Gump type of stuff. Today, he couldn't do that. The ecosystem wouldn't support it. So I think cities in their current configurations are a non-sustainable entity. And in fact, if you look back in history, none of these were either. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, so how do we go forward? We can take lessons from life. Come on, we are life. Our genome has a remnant of virtually every other life form that's ever lived on this planet. That's how connected we are with the rest of life on Earth. We are life on Earth. We're the culmination of current evolutionary trends. Look what we have resisted. Collisions with meteors, asteroids, comets, ice ages, droughts, massive floods, diseases of all kinds, continental drift, rising and falling sea levels. You realize that 40,000 years ago, the ocean was 400 feet lower than it is today? That's incredible, isn't it? 
Imagine living then and having to put up with that rise. You would have de-elected whoever was in power then. <laughs> Every single day that the world, you know, what are you gonna do? Okay, so let's learn from nature. Let's take a lesson, let's take a big lesson. Let's stop beating around the bush. We're biomimicking lots of little things. I once saw a TED talk of a guy who could crawl up a glass wall using mittens designed like gecko feet. He used nanotubes and van der Waals forces to actually support his whole weight on a glass wall. That's how the gecko does it. And they don't have feet that go this way, they have feet that go this way, so you can pull them apart to make them go down again. Isn't that clever? No, it's called evolution. Evolution can't be called clever. <laughs> so if we biomimic the best design in nature that's ever been designed, not airplanes, not shockproof walkie-talkies or ice picks designed by nature, what if we took nature's grandest design, the ecosystem, and mimicked it with our technologies? What if we could do that? What do you mean, what if we could do that? Of course, we'd get the following, wouldn't we? We'd get all these nice things that we've been searching for. They're right in front of us, they're under our nose. How come we haven't seen it? All right, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I know who you know you are. How many people here have ever had a course in ecology? Even one course. I wish I could be your teacher for at least a weekend. I could teach you enough to make you truly dangerous, <laughs> especially when it came to the next election. So ecosystems, by definition, live within their means because the sun gives them their energy. That's all you're gonna get. That's your paycheck at the end of the day. That's all you get. You have to live with it. Hmm. We don't do that, we borrow. <laughs> We're borrowing from our future. Animals and plants, both terrestrial and aquatic, all get their fair share because there's only so much. That's how nature works. So if nature has all the answers, and we think it does because we are nature, so what should our natural question be? I think the question should be this. If we only said this part of it, of course, then we could answer it yes right away because we'd need the landmass about the size of Brazil to supply food for the next three billion people, but at the point of contact between us and Brazil, eliminating the rainforest would just about seal it off for our demise. So we have to do this part too. We have to do both of these things at the same time. And I think we can do it. And in fact, I know we can do it. We captured the dust from the tail of a comet and brought it back to this planet and analyzed it and learned that comets actually formed about a million years after the solar system started to coalesce. I hope you all appreciate that knowledge because it took a lot of money and a lot of time to get that piece of information <laughs> back to Earth. And I'm not trivializing the finding, the truth that says an enormous finding, but it's even more important to live in a balanced way so we can get even more answers to more penetrating questions in the near future. And I think we can do it by creating an eco-city. And an eco-city takes the ecosystem approach and applies it to our daily lives so that everybody gets a fair share. You're not looking at a communist or a socialist. I don't know anything about politics, but I know what it's like to be a human being that doesn't get enough every day. Why? Because I'm a public health person and I've traveled enough to see the haves and the have-nots. And I think everybody can be a have. And here's how. We can create an urban agricultural system that at least starts with the premise that everybody deserves 2.3 liters of clean water and 1,500 calories of food that's safe to eat and safe to drink. We can do it. And we can do it using modern technology. We use hydroponics to produce all these crops commercially. This is going online so you'll have a chance to read this list. You can find your favorite food groups here. So the sustainable eco-city starts with urban farming as the premise of bioproductivity. 
and it uses the byproducts of our metabolism to recycle them back into energy through solids and drinking water through liquids. We do this now, we do this now. This is not new. If we could do it tomorrow, there would be no agricultural runoff. The world would rejoice. We'd get our fisheries back. There's no um, production cessation due to a season interrupting the crops. You can farm all year long inside. There's no weather-related crop losses. Uses a lot less water. No agrochemicals to speak of. When I say to speak of, it does use chemically defined diets for the plants. So there's still a role for Archer Daniel Midlands and Cargill and Monsanto. Well, I want to turn them around. Come on, I don't want to get rid of them. I want them to start doing the right thing. And the right thing is to look at the consumers. A lot of other things, that was number five. The number five was very important because we get to restore our environment by replacing farmland with indoor farms. We can remediate gray water this way. We can create new jobs, lots of them. Supplies fresh produce to inner cities. <sighs> Uses abandoned properties. And we can grow other things too, like biofuels if that's what we want to do. And we can derive drugs from plants as well this way. Look at this ratio. One indoor acre, 10 outdoor acres. Come on. Here's another choice for you. Outdoors, if you're a farmer, you control nothing. Indoors, if you're a farmer, you control everything. Take your choice. Those are the only two choices. What do you pick? I, I pick indoors. That's what I pick. 105 graduate students jump-started this idea, by the way, so that you're not just listening to a ranting, harebrained professor that's no longer practicing microbiology. You're listening to the wisdom of 106, I include myself here, people who thought through this process over the last 10 years and said, this is a good idea that needs to be tried. So how do you start any new good idea? Besides money, anybody with money is perfectly welcome to see me after this presentation. <laughs> we accept all denominations. So what if the government got involved? Oh my gosh, God forbid. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they control the flow of things anyway, so let's let them control this. Let's put them in charge of funding prototypes. Let's put them in charge of establishing an urban agricultural division within the USDA to oversee the safety of this. Let's have them help us jumpstart an international journal for urban agriculture and encourage further startups with greenhouses and rooftop gardens, et cetera, et cetera. Let's get them on board. It's not a hobby. So to start with, any good idea, a prototype, sure. Here's my favorite, it's third grade. These kids get it, the, the teacher got it. Come on, game over, you know? When, when these kids get to be adults, they wanna work in one and they wanna own them and they wanna eat the produce from them already. That's, what, that's the power of Lego that you're looking at. But we presented a viable prototype to the mayor's office in Newark recently and they really loved this idea because of the shape of the building, what it says about an inner city with lots of problems and how you might rise above that and how you might empower people. Prototypes could be located in lots of different places. These are just some of my suggestions, but you'd probably have others too. And you can partner with really good operations like NASA and Boeing and MIT and Caltech and UC Davis, and all kinds of interesting people will get involved in this. And in five years from now, I bet you if, I were, if I'm still alive and you ask me to come back here, I'll show you pictures of them and I'll take you through them and we'll have our, a lunch catered by the Washington DC branch of the Urban Agricultural Prototypical Vertical Farm Association of the United States. <laughs> There's been a lot of interest here. That's the, the soon-to-be former mayor of Chicago holding up my book. So I'm through. This monitor tells me I'm done. But you don't say that, do you? You want me to go on for another hour, don't you? <laughs> and I wish I could, but I can't. So it's time for me to stop talking and time for us to start doing. Farm fresh, farm smart, save water, 
save land, save, live sustainably, let the earth repair itself, keep our blue planet green, learn more, read the book. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>